Everyone always brags that they either have or know of the best Halloween scary story. Everyone except me. I don't have a story, I have the truth. Whenever I've told this story to other people, they've responded with terrified gasps, tears, wide disbelieving eyes, or flat out called me a liar. You're free to call me a liar as well, but I have the scar to prove it. This happened to me in late October of 2013 in Tamworth, New Hampshire. At the time, I was working as a contractor, and my friend Toby and I had each separately driven to a ramshackle old house, at least 40 years old, at the top of a very steep incline deep in the woods. The house had been foreclosed upon by the bank, and all the property inside had been abandoned. We had been hired to look at the house and provide an estimate for renovating it, to determine whether it was worth reselling or better off being torn down for scrap. I had my doubts immediately upon discovering that there was no driveway, but instead a long dirt pathway with a string railing leading up to a small two-story structure. Toby and I unlocked the place with the key and made our way inside. We checked the wiring first, then the walls and support beams for possible termite damage before we checked the water heater. It was about that time Toby got a phone call from his guys on another job and had to leave. He left me the key, and I told him I'd call him when I finished up and give him my final thoughts, even though we were both leaning towards scrapping the house. After Toby left, I checked upstairs, which was pretty much just a loft bedroom. I made my way down into the basement to inspect the furnace. Part of me wanted to skip the basement altogether. I was certain that there was nothing down there that was going to change my mind about the house, but I'm nothing if not professional and efficient. The best contractors never cut corners. The basement door was inside the pantry and led down to a single small area that was beneath the living room above. It had a dirt floor, shelving along the walls, a bunch of cardboard boxes stacked on top of bricks, and a few small pieces of furniture, including an ancient rocking chair and a nightstand. There was also about a 30 by 15 window in the wall facing the front of the property. In retrospect, my biggest mistake was not taking my flashlight. There was no power in the house, but given that it was still daylight out, I figured I wouldn't need it. Even in the basement, the small window was providing enough light for me to inspect the furnace. I spent a couple minutes looking over it and stood up and leaned towards the window, so my back was to the staircase. I pulled out my phone and took two steps forward, not really walking towards anything directly, just stretching my legs. My eyes were on my phone, and that's when the pain started. The sensation was so sudden, so extreme, both of my hands flew up to my face and my phone went flying, landing in the dirt somewhere off to my side. I immediately tried to step backwards and realized I couldn't. I was literally hooked to the spot. One thing I had noticed earlier were several fishing poles stored horizontally through the hanging wooden beams above. What I had failed to notice was the single hook dangling loose from one of them, and I stepped right into it, resulting in the hook impaling itself directly through my right eyelid. I immediately started panicking. I raised my arms above my head and tried to free the pole from the ceiling, but it had been fed through the overhead beams, and there was no way I could free it while being caught by the hook. I tried tugging on the line and then on the pole itself, trying to snap something free myself, but the angle didn't work to my advantage, and every time I pulled at the line, a white hot jolt of pain would course through my face. Ultimately, I couldn't see what I was doing well enough to detach myself. The pain was interfering with my rational thinking, and I forced myself to take a breath and try to think. Okay. My eyelid was snagged, but my eye itself was fine. I wasn't bleeding, but I couldn't move. I couldn't squat down, and I could barely pivot my body in either direction to turn. I started scanning the floor for my cell phone, but I couldn't locate it anywhere. I started feeling around with my foot, trying to find it, but was unable to. That's about when the severity of the situation hit me. I was stuck in the basement of a house no one had any reason to visit, and was very much out of shouting distance from the road. My truck was still parked below, but how many hours would it take for Toby or my wife to become suspicious and come back and check on me? I started fishing through my pockets, looking for anything sharp to cut the line. I didn't have a knife on me, but I had my keys. Awkwardly, I raised my heavy ring of keys over my head, found the line with my other hand, and tried sawing the line with the sharpest key I had. The problem was not only that every pull of the line was another stab of pain to my face, but I couldn't properly see what I was doing, and therefore didn't even know if it was working. I thought about just wrenching the hook free with all my might, but decided against it. Not only would that be unbelievably painful, but I may have ended up permanently damaging my eye. After a few minutes of extreme discomfort, I lowered the keys. It was shocking how quickly my arms had grown tired. I tried to calm myself down and just breathe. 
convinced that before long someone would try calling me, and then I would at least get a sense of where my phone was, and I could try to reach for it with my legs again. I don't know exactly how much time passed, but try to imagine being forced to stand in one spot for hours, unable to stop the stabbing sensation of pain tugging at your eyelid without any knowledge of how long you might be forced to remain there. For what felt like the first hour, I spat out quite a few profanities, furious with myself for missing the hook, Toby for leaving early, and threatening the life of whoever left the fishing poles where they were. I did a lot of leg lifts to try to keep the blood in my legs flowing and attempted to saw my way free with the keys several times, but the best I could tell, I wasn't even making a mark on the line. It grew dark outside, and to my great dismay and annoyance, I suddenly found myself in near pitch darkness, with a slight gray rectangle against the window being my only source of light. It was about that time I heard my phone ring. It was somewhere to my right behind me. I turned around as best as I could and tried to locate it and drag it forward with my toe, but I still couldn't find it. Even with the phone illuminating itself slightly in the dark as it rang, it was out of my line of sight and unfortunately also out of reach. After an indeterminable amount of time that could have been 15 minutes or 3 hours, I saw a light coming from outside. It wasn't an electric light from a flashlight, it was the flickering orange hue of a fire. I immediately felt my inside soar and I prepared to call out as loud as I could, but just as I inhaled and made to scream, I slapped my hands over my mouth. Through the window, facing the front of the house, I noticed the lower half of people in sheets walking across the property, straight to the front door. There were at least three of them, and I heard the door above me open, and the sound of heavy footsteps thudding across the living room floor. The basement was illuminated ever so slightly by the faint orange glow of firelight from above, slipping down through the cracks in the floorboards. My mind raced. What was happening? Were these people part of a cult? Or were they bored kids celebrating Halloween slightly early, intending to get high? Either way, they were trespassing, and I was weighing my options as to whether it would be a good idea to call out when I heard a scream. It was muffled and sounded like it had come from a young woman. From above me, I heard two firm voices shout across the yard to keep her quiet. That's when the light of more torches started appearing in the front yard, and with them came more robed figures, crossing in front of the window and climbing the steps into the house. I don't think I got an accurate count of the figures walking past the window in the dark, but I guess there were between 8 and 10. I heard them gathering in the room above me, the sound of them shifting their way and assembling in a circle extremely loud and unnervingly close. My hands were both clenched into fists, but I wasn't sure why. Again, I examined my options. Clearly, the men upstairs didn't want anyone to know that they were there, and I didn't know what they would do if they discovered I was down here. But I had a feeling them just leaving me as I was wasn't the worst case scenario. It wasn't like I was in any position to properly defend myself. I decided to wait it out for a while longer and try to get a sense of exactly what they were doing. If they were only there to drink and smoke pot, I figured I was probably alright. I heard soft murmuring of voices above me, though I couldn't exactly tell what they were saying. That's when there was an alarmingly loud crash of what sounded like someone hitting the floor above me, and then the front door slammed shut. I heard someone bark loudly. Was this unlocked? Someone else in the room muttered a reply. I felt my blood run cold. I assumed he meant the door. Had I left anything obvious lying around upstairs? Something they would notice and perhaps make them suspicious that someone else was nearby? I drew a blank, and suddenly, for one of the few times in my adult life, I was very, very afraid. The group of people above me started chanting a hymn of some kind. Another voice rose above the crowd. My brothers, engage with me. Be not forlorn, for his hour approaches. Oh shit, I thought. That's a bad sign. The chanting continued rhythmically, but not quite loud enough to drown out the muffled sobs of a terrified woman coming from directly above me. From the range of her voice, I could tell she was much closer to the ground and probably gagged. This isn't happening. This can't be happening. I shifted around uncomfortably, my fists rising and falling indecisively as though I was shadowboxing. As I tried to convince myself this was all some elaborate joke, there came a gruff command from above. Now raise your palm. He repeated himself loudly after a moment, and then his voice became sinister. Which shall I take? Take what, I thought. Wait, was this guy about to start hacking off? 
there came a metallic snap and a blood-curdling scream, and the tone of the chanting changed. It went from dull and stoic to more high-pitched and excited. That's when it happened. A trickle of something leaked down from between the floorboards and fell into my hair and on my shoulder. I nearly cursed out loud and backed away half a step, and I noticed a steady stream of warm liquid running down from the cracks above. I wiped up my hair with my hand. Yep, that was blood. There came two more metallic snaps and two more agonized screams before the chanting reached its peak, and all I could do was stand there, practically motionless, unable to act in any way, whether to save the victim from above or run for help. I was surprised their roar of chanting wasn't alerting the neighbors, despite how far away we were from the road. Just as the mock ceremony seemed to be winding down, my cell phone rang, and I felt my heart stop. I lashed out with my foot, trying to locate the phone again, to silence it, to smash it. The chanting from above was softening, but the phone continued to ring, over and over, like it was trying to intentionally betray me. The chanting turned into a low murmur, and the phone rang once more, before it fell quiet. For what felt like a short eternity, there was almost no noise from above, and I was convinced that they were probably all looking at each other in confusion, wondering where the sound of the phone had come from. Suddenly, I heard a whimpering sound and a creak in the floor above me, and it sounded like someone was helping the girl up. The leader said another few words, something about everlasting pain and fire and brimstone. I honestly don't remember. And after another few moments of silence, I heard the door creak open and the torchlight was suddenly cast out again onto the front of the property. This time, their shadows danced against the nearby trees as they filed out, and for the first time, I noticed the horrific nature of their silhouettes. All of them had disfigured heads, several with horns and a few with beaks. My heart nearly leapt out of my chest as I tried to calm myself. They were just wearing masks. They had to be. I watched several sets of robed legs walking past the window, and my breathing finally started to slow and became somewhat easier that's when I felt it. Air on the back of my neck. There was someone in the basement with me. I hadn't heard anyone come down the stairs, but there was no mistake. Someone was literally breathing down my neck. Instead of turning, I slowly, cautiously raised my right arm and glanced at the face of my wristwatch. Reflecting back against the glass was a face peering over my shoulder, but not just any face. It was the face of a plague doctor's mask. Its giant blank eyes bore into my soul, staring unblinkingly at me for perhaps five seconds. Then I lowered the watch and raised my fist, ready to tear my eyelid and spin around and throw a punch. I don't remember planning to say anything, but out of my mouth spewed a sudden desperate plea. I didn't see anything. There came no response. And what felt like another half minute later, I heard the unmistakable sound of footsteps climbing the basement stairs. The footsteps softly crossed the living room, down the front steps, and the front door slammed shut. I gasped loudly as though my head had been held underwater. Had I not still been hooked, I would have sunk to my knees, but instead, I shook all over and prayed to be free of this hell I had trapped myself in. It was perhaps 20 minutes later when the police arrived. They had been en route to the house to look for me anyway, as requested by my wife and Toby, when they received a disturbance call from some neighbors down the street that someone had thrown a torch into the woods and started a small fire. The fire was quickly put out, and when I called out to the police, they quickly found me and cut me loose, and I immediately sank to my knees in exhaustion. I told them everything as I sat on the front step, and the paramedic examined my eye. I was taken to ER where they were able to remove the hook successfully, fortunately without it causing any permanent damage. I had been ensnared by it for over four hours. The police arrived while I was in the recovery room and questioned me on the incident all over again. One of the officers held out my cell phone in a plastic evidence bag. They asked me if it was mine. I said it was, that I had dropped it in the basement and it had nearly given me away. The officer gave me a haggard look and said, We found it on the front steps. There's always a reason to be afraid. Thank you guys so much for graciously allowing me to fill in for Unit today while he takes care of some important stuff. My name is CZ, and if you like what I do with the animation, music, and sound design, you can head on over here and subscribe to my horror channel, CZ's World. If you do decide to, then I will see you in the next one, assuming you both survive.